China is projected to set up its own space station around 2020. We are currently implementing the Space Lab plan. We will launch Chengyang 2 and Shenzhou 11 spacecraft to dock with it this year. We will also carry out a series of Space Lab experiments. That was the director of the China National Space Administration, Xu Daozhi, talking about some of China's planned missions. Welcome back. We're talking about China's space program. Let's get back to our panel. Uh, Yu Guang, let me ask you about the Space Lab or the uh, space station that's going to be there that China is building. How will it be different from the current International Space Station? Well, you see, uh, the China's future space station is much smaller than ISS and even than Mir. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's composed of uh, three 20-ton uh, uh, level modules. Uh, so the total mass will be about 60-ton uh, level. But because it can adopt many advanced technologies, so it can do much more things than the Mir. Uh, so, uh, in the future, China hopes that this station can be built as the uh, national laboratory of China in space uh, in the future. Uh, and also, uh, this station, uh, we, we hope that we can uh, solve many key technologies in the future, uh, such as the uh, long-term duration of manned flight in the space. Uh, so, I believe that uh, the next mission, uh, I mean the uh, Tiangong 2 and the Shenzhou 11, uh, 11 mission, will be a very good preparation work for the future uh, China's future space station. Uh, you see that uh, for a space station, uh, the, mm, the, the long-term duration of manned space flight uh, need to have so many uh, uh, key technologies. For instance, the regenerative uh, life support systems uh, and also uh, the refueling technologies. So uh, I uh, and also the midterm uh, midterm uh, duration of manned stay in space will be a, a major task for the future uh, Shenzhou 11 uh, mission, uh, mission. This can be recognized as a milestone uh, for the uh, establishment, establishment uh, of the future China space station. Leroy, uh, Professor John Logston talked a minute ago about the, uh, the movie, The Martian. Of course, that is fiction. But in that movie, uh, Matt Damon's character gets stranded on the planet, and then China is asked to resupply Matt Damon, and it turns out that China has some kind of top secret rocket. And it all turns out well. But you know, something that you said earlier on uh, about more cooperation between countries on space exploration, there's actually a law in the United States that prevents that. Um, why does the US implement a law like that? Why do they pass a law like that? Is there, uh, what is the concern here? Right. So, you know, there's been this uh, issue going on for quite some time now. When I left NASA about a little over 10 years ago, uh, I thought certainly in five or 10 years, relations between the U.S. and China will be better and, and maybe we'll be cooperating in space. The fact is, 10 years later, the relations are actually worse. And unfortunately, uh, it's because of certain members of Congress, of the U.S. Congress, uh, who are very vocal about it. Uh, when President Obama came into office eight years ago and Charlie Bolden became the NASA administrator, uh, both of them were very much in favor of doing more in China, with China, especially in space, but even they couldn't get it done with these uh, just a handful of uh, very vocal opponents in Congress. So. I think it comes down to simple uh, xenophobia, unfortunately. The arguments that they make against working with China don't hold water. They're, they say that they're concerned about spying, they're concerned about technology transfer. Uh, well, you know, we've been working just fine with the Russians for you know, over 20 years, uh, cooperating very closely on technology and other things. And to my knowledge, there have been no improper transfers of technology in either direction. So why wouldn't those safeguards work? And I think it just comes down to, you know, the, the impression that some Americans have, unfortunately, that, um, you know, China is just this one big block, monolithic block that, that is uh, against us. And, I, you know, that's obviously not true. It's uh, an oversimplification. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I hope that this can change. But uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, it is law, as you pointed out, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. Right, John, getting back to what some kind of module would do uh, on the surface of Mars. I mean, there would be instruments that would carry out a whole lot of experiments, but would it address or help us understand the broader questions of things like how the universe evolved, maybe even the origins of life? Well, especially. I mean, the, the key question in, exploration, in the exploration of Mars is was there ever life there? Might there even be life there now? Uh, so it's the search for life that drives most of, of uh, science on Mars. And as, as was commented earlier, the kind of holy grail for the scientific community is bringing pieces of Mars back, right. so-called Mars sample return. And there are all kinds of issues associated with that. What, uh, 
what rights do Martian microbes have? Do we have the right to go and grab something that may contain a life form and bring it back to Earth? So there are lots of interesting non-technical as well as technical challenges ahead for the uh, total exploration of, uh, of Mars, even before people get there. Right, and I guess that's the mistake we often make. We think about life forms as being things like us but there may be other life forms there. Oh, uh, uh, they're much more likely to be other forms, probably uh, given the conditions and evolution of Mars, uh, only small life forms, bacteria, microbes. Uh, uh, we're not gonna see little red or green men uh, waving at, at the cameras on one of these rovers. Right. Carl, do the Europeans have anything in the pipeline in the way of sending a probe or any other type of vehicle to Mars? Well, we have, we just launched uh, together with Roscosmos, our Russian uh, uh, cooperation partner, in March this year, the first of the two ExoMars missions. This is a TGO, it's a trace gas orbiter. The first, uh, uh, it will study the, uh, the uh, atmosphere and, and look for traces of gases. Again, this is to see if we can find uh, possible life on Mars. And in, two, in four years from now, in 2020, we will send the second ExoMars, together with Roscosmos uh, uh, again, who, that will uh, descend and land on Mars, and which will rover and also drill, which is because we believe that if we can drill on Mars, we will be able to analyze these samples and see, get a better answer to the question of, uh, which you all want to know, is whether there is life on, on Mars or not. Um, you're going, uh, do all these missions, including the Chinese mission, do they all have as the ultimate aim putting a human on the planet? Uh, well, uh, a human mission to Mars is, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a goal of all space capable nations, but maybe uh, will be much later than the United States. You see, uh, the United States has announced its goal is to send humans to Mars and safely back. Uh, this is the goal, but uh, I should emphasize that for Russia, China, and Europe, uh, or Japan, uh, it is a necessary step for us to uh, first go to the moon uh, because for, uh, from the aspect of technologies, uh, any nation which, uh, who wants to go to Mars uh, must have to uh, have the uh, successful lunar missions first, uh, uh, lunar uh, human missions first. This is a, a very necessary step. Uh, so in the future, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the, the chief of ESA uh, has announced the concept of, of the moon village. Uh, to uh, which is the initiative uh, to have all the uh, capable nations together to have a, a lunar base uh, in the future. Uh, I believe this is a very uh, hopeful uh, suggestion in the future to have all these countries uh, cooperate together. And on the other hand, the, Ameri uh, the United States uh, can benefit from the moon village because uh, a utilization of the uh, resources on the lunar surface will uh, help. Uh, a better development of the future human missions to Mars. Leroy, you know, when we look at this, these missions to Mars, uh, it's fascinating, you know, it really catches the public imagination. A lot of what we talk about right now was the stuff of science fiction just a few decades ago. Uh, and there's now talk of having human beings on Mars in the 2020s. Uh, do you think we would be able to put humans on Mars? And that's not far away, that's just, you know, a decade away. Well, let's see, I haven't actually heard anyone saying in the 2020s, NASA has va very vaguely said 2030s plus. And so there, you know, the fact is there is not a current Mars program. There's a lot of talk about Mars, which is inspiring, but the fact is there's been no political or financial commitment on the, by the United States or anyone else to put humans on Mars. There's just been talk about a Mars mission in the future. So. I, I am hopeful that one day we will get to Mars, and it is a very, uh, it's gonna be the next interesting place to explore, but as we've kind of been discussing, the moon makes a lot of sense to go to f again first. You know, there are those who argue that, yeah, we've been there before. Well, the fact is we, we haven't been there since 1972, so we need to relearn how to operate in that kind of environment, how to land on that environment. And we need a, t a place to test out all of our habitats, our rovers, spacesuits, and all of those things before we send them to Mars. Because uh, once you do that burn towards Mars, you're not going to be able to get anything back or any one back until you go all the way to Mars and back. You simply wouldn't have the fuel. So you want to make sure everything's going to work perfectly before you send it out there. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can put together this international coalition and the United States will resume its, uh, its natural position of leading this effort, having the experience in the first place and having the resources and, 
and uh, frankly, on the International Space Station, demonstrating the ability to bring all these partner countries together, uh, I think it'd be the, the right way to go. John, Leroy makes some great points there about the United States program, but there have been cuts to NASA, funding for NASA. Uh, has the United States government, the state, effectively got out of the space business and has now handed it over to private companies, people like SpaceX? That's silly. I mean, the United States is spending $3 billion a year operating the space station. We're in the temporary period after the shutdown of the shuttle program until we restore our transportation capability to the station, but that will happen in the next couple of years. And we're building a large rocket and a deep space spacecraft, all government programs. Yes, there's SpaceX, and uh, Leroy, uh, uh, Elon says he can get people on Mars in the 2020s. We'll see. Uh, but um, th there are two space exploration programs in the United States, including a, a, a pretty well-funded, I mean, $6 billion a year, $8 billion a year for human spaceflight is a lot more than anybody else, any other government is spending. Just so to, the impression that the United States government is out of the human spaceflight business is just plain wrong. If you like what you just saw, follow us on social media and visit our website, cctv-america.com.